welcome to the Cambridge Science Festival, welcome to the Harvard Museum of Natural History, and welcome to What If? Alternative Histories of Science. I am Anne Harrington, I'm an historian of science at Harvard University, and I'm joined this evening by three of my fellow historian colleagues, David Jones, who is up here um, doing something with his laptop, Andrew Berry, uh, who is laughing at David Jones a little bit, and Roberto Lali from MIT. Uh, I'm also joined uh, by two comedians who are going to now sit up on stage, and I will explain to you why they're here. Uh, I think this is probably, for me, one of the most unusual events that I've ever had the opportunity to moderate as an historian of science. So why do we have comedians? You can sit down. I mean, you, just for now. Just for now. Then you're, they're going to they're gonna take over in, in, in a minute. Well, this is not business as usual. Uh, what, here, here's, the, here's the idea. Um, we've identified three big areas of science that have a lot of contemporary salience um, in our culture. The brain sciences, the life sciences, particularly evolutionary life sciences, and physics, the physical sciences. And we've asked, invited ourselves to speculate what if certain, at certain key moments something different had happened than in fact did happen. What kind of world might we all be living in? What kind of scientific world, a world of science, might we all be living in? So more specifically, what if in fact in the early 19th century, a one-time very, very popular and widely accepted theory of how the mind relates to the brain, later debunked completely, what if it had turned out to be true? Or what if, our second what if, what if Charles Darwin never got on the Beagle that took him off on the great voyage that ended up giving him the inspiration and material ideas uh, that helped him to develop the theory of evolution by natural selection. What if he'd never gotten on that boat? What might have happened? And finally, what if in the physical sciences, a one-time very widely accepted concept, entity, the luminiferous ether, believed by many people in the late 19th century not only to be very important for understanding the nature of light and magnetism and other physical forces, but possibly also believed by many to be a conduit to this world of spirits. Also, later, decided decisively, doesn't exist. What if it did? What kind of world collectively might all of us be living in if all these things had unfolded differently? We're going to pursue each of these alternative histories in turn to start. Uh, give each historian about 20 to 25 minutes to chat with the comedians about his history and how it might have looked if things had unfolded differently. At the end of that, which should take us to about 8.30, um, we'll take a five minute break uh, in order to create on stage a kind of a round table living room setting and we'll take a final 25 or 20 or 25 minutes to try to pull it all together, uh, to talk among the group and to bring you into the conversation. And we should end about nine o'clock. I think that I will get off the stage uh, and turn it over to David Jones, Kevin Harrington, and Raj <coughs> Sivaraman. Please welcome me, welcome them all. Well, thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see such a turnout on a beautiful spring night here in Cambridge. The, uh, the task I've been given is to talk about what if, the, what if, what would the world be like if phrenology had been correct? Now, the idea behind phrenology is quite a simple one, and I have the slide uh, to, to help take you through this. But how many here has ever, ever applied to a school, a college, a high school, or anything? Anyone here ever applied? <laughs> Anyone here ever apply for a job? <laughs> has anyone been at the other end? Has anyone ever interviewed applicants for a school or a job? Smaller number. And anyone ever selected a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, or a wife? <laughs> All of these tasks, which are ancient tasks, humans have been doing these things for a very long time. 
share a common feature and that you're trying to judge the worth of another person. You're trying to make a prediction about them now. And this is someone you're going to spend a lot of time with, either as a student, as a spouse, as an employer. And the question is how to do that. Now, humans are social creatures. We're very good in some respects at judging other people. But there's always a suspicion. What if the person is deceiving you in some way? They can dress themselves up in a way to make themselves look wealthier or fancier in some respect. And if you rely on what you say, then you can be fooled because people become very good at present, presenting themselves in such a way that they present what you want, what you want, they present what they want you to see and not what might be their inner self. And so this is an anxiety that humans have felt for centuries. And the goal of phrenology was to allow you to escape from that anxiety. It was to provide a way for you to assess the worth of other people in a concrete, objective, scientific way so that you could make a good decision about who to admit to Harvard College, who to hire as an employee, who to work for, or whom to spend the rest of your life with. So that the ambition of phrenology is an entirely easy one to relate to. Well, then the question is, well, how was phrenology actually implemented? Now, for phrenology to work, there are only four things that need to be true, and each of which you'll see is quite straightforward. So the first claim of phrenology was that the brain is the organ of the mind. Everything that we do that we associate with cognitive activity, with thought, speech, memory, personality, all of these things, the phrenologists would claim, resided in the brain. And that was something that people are quite willing to accept. If any of you have ever seen, or in a movie or te television show, someone who has their head chopped off, they lose all of those functions. <laughs> for, for, it's, it's likely no coincidence that phrenology, phrenology emerged in Europe right in the aftermath of the French Revolution, <laughs> where people had a lot of experience seeing what happened when you severed heads from bodies. So the first claim uh, is a simple claim. The second claim is that brain functions are specialized. So the brain is not just a single mass of tissue in which function is distributed throughout, but that different things are localized in different parts of the brain. And again, some of these things make sense. We see with our eyes, we hear with our ears. Why should you expect the deeper functions of the brain to be any different? So the claim was that there was a part of the brain that would be associated with color perception, or a part of the brain that was associated with speech part of the brain that was associated with how you moved your hands or where you felt sensation on your back. But as people got more sophisticated with this, they also realized that there were specific parts of the brain for subtler functions. And you can start to see this on the map that's shown here. There were areas of the brain that would re reflect your ability to be educated, an important thing to look for in a college applicant. Parts of the brain that would, would correlate with how passionate you were what sort of sexual creature you might be, for good or for bad. Parts of the brain that reflected good aspects of your personality, your ability to stay dedicated to a particular topic, or possibly to destructive aspects of your personality, like were you going to be a destructive or a violent person? So the idea was each of these regions is localized in a part of the brain. Again, not too hard to, to imagine. There had been a lot of experience that people, if people get injured in their brain, if you lose one part of the brain, you might lose a specific function, but have other parts of the brain working quite well. So the first claim is the brain is where thought takes place. Second claim is that different mental faculties are localized in different areas. The third claim is that size matters. Again, something that comes up in many spheres of life. But the idea here was that these different regions of the brain had different levels of activity. One person's brain might do, might do more of one thing, another person's brain might be better at other talents, and that the areas where you were best at, either innately or by training, would be larger because you'd be exercising that part of the brain more. So again, relatively simple claim, the more you use something, the bigger it is, and the size of these different areas will matter. And then the fourth claim is just a simple consequence of all of this. Since the brain is always exerting pressure on the skull as you develop and through life, the size of these different areas of the brain is reflected in subtleties of the shape of the skull, such that, such that if you want to understand the person's abilities in various mental regions, all you needed to do was to inspect, or even better, to palpate the skull. And you would know how large or small that area was. And if you were equipped with a map such as this, 
then you could come up with an excellent personality test of this individual, knowing objectively, scientifically, because you were essentially measuring with your fingers the magnitude of the talent that they had in each of these 27 domains. And so this was the vision, that you could do this, and then it would allow you to work. And so for instance, suppose I was trying to recruit Kevin to see if he would be a useful comedian for a night like this. <laughs> There are certain things you could do right off. You could look and have a sense of the shape of his forehead, the slope of his forehead, how bulbous these back regions, these are the, the sexual areas <laughs> of the brain. Are. We're just getting, can we get this on? Okay, it's on. Ability to use microphone is there somewhere. <laughs> as you can see, I mean, Dave, this, is the, the, this is evolution as we see right here. The chimpanzee and Homo erectus. And so the, the, the first act of a phrenologist would be to inspect and to see what you could learn. And the great thing about the inspection aspect of phrenology is you could do it on anyone without them knowing that they were being inspected. So I could be sitting here gazing out into the front row doing very careful assessments of who's going to laugh and the right jokes, uh, who is a lost cause in terms of an audience for a show like this, and I'd go from there. But to really know, you would have to approach the person, ideally with their permission. You have my permission to touch my scalp. <laughs> And you would, you would inspect. This you, is completely relaxing for them. <laughs> to have a stranger and an academic touching your head. And you would run through, and if your fingers had been properly trained, you would be able to, to go through. And if you notice, a lot of these regions are quite small. So you're talking about areas this, on the... Not mine. <laughs> you could see how hard it was for him to touch my skull, so ladies will do the math. Smart. Exactly. Yeah. And so you'd need to have a considerable amount of finesse as you did this, but you could go through, and by the end of this exercise, you would know, is he someone who has a capacity to be educated? Uh, I'm not sure. Let's hope. <laughs> you, could, you, could, you could tell if someone had wit or charm or ability to crack a good joke, and that's what we're really hoping. Check. <laughs> or then you could also scope out the, possible, the negative aspects that this person might have. So now, if this had turned out to be true, it's not too hard to imagine how different the world would be. So one thing you'd want you could be aware of uh, is that if you were all in a world where you were constant, constantly ex examining each other's phrenological capacities, it'd be a world of constant surveillance, either for better or for worse. Now, in such a world, you would, of course, be suspicious of anyone who had a full head of hair. <laughs> because why else would you grow hair if not to conceal these things that you were trying to hide from people who might be inspecting your capacities. Like my great jokes, I gotta keep them inside. The, uh, <laughs> Not all of them are winners. <laughs> <laughs> or you could imagine, if for anyone who's applied recently to college, you know, this is the season of college admissions. Many of you have gone through this, it's a painful process, there are essays, there are SAT scores, there are interviews. Imagine how much easier life would be if all you had to do was to show up at an interview's office relax, and have a scalp massage. <laughs> when you add scalp massage, I, think, I don't think there's a person in the room that would object to that. So that is fairly loaded, but I agree with you 100%. If you were to hire someone for a job, you could do the same sort of thing. The, the whole areas of life which, with a, which we take so seriously now, the dating process, again, you could just short circuit the whole thing. You'd feel <laughs> someone's head, they would feel your head, uh, and you would know. <laughs> at the outset, how these things were going to turn out. The question is, well, what, what would happen with a system like this? Are there, are there bad things that could go awry, or things that could go awry if we were living in such a world? Or would it just be a world of unmitigated inside knowledge of everyone who is out and about? So how do you think it would work? Well, I personally think it would be terrifying. Uh, I, I am a very touchy-feely person.